filled her lungs. And there, she was, she was trying with that, with that sickness. It was tuberculosis and uh, flourishing. Her lungs were filled with water and she nearly died. And there in Singapore, she received the Lord Jesus Christ. And she said, Pastor, I now understand that the blood of Jesus is truly, truly powerful. Hallelujah. You can imagine that the seed of my preaching 15 years ago, it took 15 years to save that woman because of our slaughterhouse religion. Do you believe in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Yes. You should believe. You should take it by heart because it is the only way that will change you forever. It is the only vehicle that can bring you to heaven. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't you know that when Adam was banished from the Garden of Eden, there was already, already blood? I think it's in Genesis chapter 3. I'd like to go back a little bit to that. Exodus, I don't know, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And Adam called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin with streaks of blood in it. That's what it's saying in my Bible. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword, which turned every day to guard away to the tree of life. There's not only the blood, there's also the cross, which is being represented by the sword. Hallelujah. You see how God planned everything? From beginning, Genesis to Revelation, this book is filled with blood. I don't know if I can tear half of the Bible and the blood is gone. The blood is still here. It's the blood of the Lamb. The blood of redemption. Number three. Hallelujah. It is the blood of remission. Hebrews 9, 22. And according to almost all things are birds with the blood and without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness or remission or atonement of sin. J.P. Morgan was one of the great financiers of the United States of America. He was able to survive his business in the Great Recession. And you know, his will contained 10,000 words. And one of the statements says there like this. I entreat my children to receive the atonement of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is the only thing that will save them. It is the only thing that will change their lives. Even if how much money I have to leave them without the atonement of the blood of Christ, that money would have no value. Wow. You see that? No value. That's why... You're earning now. You work in a foreign land. You have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let it be that every cent count and entreat the blood of Christ in your earnings. Then you will find success. You will find joy. You will have everything that you want because the Lord will just continue to pour out your blessing. He will prosper you. He doesn't want you to stay to, to remain the same. He wants you to change level by level. And He wants to reach you whatever your ambition, if you obey the Word of God, then God will bring you to the place where you will have no rivals. No competition. Why? Because God is your guide every day. He is the one who guards you. Just read Psalm 91. And your protection will be complete. Look to
to the hills, Psalm 121. Where does my help come from? Everything comes from God. He has forgiven you. He has atoned your sins. And you are free. We have freedom. Number four, it is the blood of justification. Romans 5, 9. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Just as if you have been never sinned. You see, justification is a, a step higher than forgiveness. You are forgiven, right? But God, I will justify you. I have justified you. I forget everything that you have. There was one guy who, uh, when I was teaching Bible school in Iloilo in, in, in 1980, there was one guy who I caught praying. I think three times I caught him praying the same sing all over and over again and one day he said you know pastor today i was praying i was so depressed because i keep on going to god with the same sin every morning and then you know what pastor today i heard god saying what sin you need to say that the guilt is gone because god erased everything from his memory you have no sin because you came down at the foot of the foot of the cross. But sometimes we disassociate ourselves with the cross. Why? You see, this is a beautiful cross. Yeah? Beautiful. It is so trim, so shiny. We have crosses in the lapels of our coats, like cross the beam. We have crosses in our necklaces. We have crosses in both in our Bible. We have crosses everywhere. The value of the cross sometimes is gone. You see, the cross that Christ has been crucified is an old, rugged cross. It is not the same. It is so... Uh, I, I cannot describe it. It's a rugged cross. Rugged, rugged cross. Otherwise, Christ did not suffer. His, the, cross was, the cross was so smooth like this. It was so rough. It pricks his body more than anything else. So brothers and sisters, give importance to where you came from. Where did you come from? At the cross of Christ Jesus. At the cross. That's why you have to be grateful. Yeah, we enjoy giving. Because you know that when we give, there are blessings coming. It's a principle of sowing and reaping. You have to sow to reap. If you sow, you will reap. If you do this, you will reap. All things will come back to you when you reap, when you, when you sow. But this is a different kind of sowing. You sow from the depths of your heart. Sometimes the Bible speaks of the natural uh, sowing and reaping. And it applies also to the natural man, to those who are not saved. When they invest here, it's sure that they will have profits. They will sow, they will reap. But the, the, the sowing and reaping that the Bible speaks is not just the natural sowing. You have to sow from your bosom in order to reap the reward of the spirits. Amen? Number five. It is the blood of peace. Colossians 1 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things of heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Wow. Peace. Before we have a dis our distance from God is so wide because of sin. Because of our of the kind of life that we live. But now because of the cross, he has given us peace. And he is not anymore our adversary. It is the blood of reconciliation. It has the same context as the blood of peace. As one, one writer, Jack Henning, says, instead of wrath, instead of wrath, the anger of God, you receive mercy. Instead of hell, you receive heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Instead of judgment, you are justified. Instead of having an adversary, you have 
an advocate. Hallelujah. Kung sa ilong ko, kung, kung sa ilong ko ba, natay kaapin, natay kauban. We have a companion in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only a companion, but a friend, an advocate. Hallelujah. It is the blood, number seven, of entrance, Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, you are saved. It is the only way that we can enter the presence of the Heavenly Father. So many religions say that our religion is the way. Buddhist tells us it's the way. Taoist tells us it's the way. To pai 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 in front of their ancestors is the way. No. The Bible only says there's only one way. John 14, 6, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Through me. Other says by me. But I think the most uh, the most powerful word to use is through him. We have to get through everything in our life in order to come to the presence of the Father. You have to get through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, except then that you cannot go to the presence of the Father. You cannot be drawn by the Father into his presence without Christ in your life. Without Jesus in your heart, without His presence in your whole being. That's why you have to hear and hear the Word of God. That's the only thing that your faith will grow and the grace in you will start to burst, to grow, and you can share it to everybody you meet. Hallelujah. Number eight. It is a blood that cleanses. John 1, 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the blood. Cleanse. That's why you don't feel guilt anymore. But there's a warning. You are cleansed if you stay in the presence of God. But there's a danger in everything that you do also. We have to be careful in what we do, in how we are. A little bit more and done. Who redeems your life from the pit. What are those pits? Pits of sin, pits of destruction, pits of your habits that had been developed into character. A little drink now, just, I'm just tasting this. The next day, you, you already made two shots. The third day, three shots. A month later, you can already finish a case of beer or a bottle of wine. And then your hangover comes. I know a friend in Cebu. His father counted all the fondadors that he drank from the day that he drank. And he finished 350 bottles and he died. Cirrhosis of the liver. And the guy was so young, full of potential, but he wasted in life, his life, just by drinking that every night. Every night, his father would tell him. You know, this guy would drink every day. He would buy seven bottles of Fontador every week and drink it every day. And when he died, his father counted it 350 bottles. And I said to his father, it only takes 350 bottles for your son to die. No salvation. Miserable life. And while he was drinking and drinking, he becomes cynical and critical. Everything that he sees, he is seeing. Everything that he, uh, he sees in people are wrong. Everything is wrong. Nothing is right. You want to be like that? You want to grow old and be cynical and grind yourself, weary yourself, criticizing other people? No. I hope not. I hope not. Because it, be, it will be a miserable life. So, those are the pits of destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. You know, my hair is so great. I'm just putting up some... Uh, uh, props. Lubung-lubung, <laughs> lubung-lubung. Uh, uh, tina-tina. 
Hindi na para mag-look ka uh, young. But my heart is still young. I'm still in love. In love with Jesus, of course. I, I, it's really a passion to speak the word of God, to share the word of God. And to find life whenever, to find life in other people that I've been sharing with. Just like that woman who received Christ 15 years after my crusade in Sakai. Working hard in order for people to save, to be saved. Without expecting nothing. Because the word of God is for free. It's not for, uh, for uh, it's not to take money, the money of people, but to save the soul, to save the lost. So you can learn from older people. If you go back to your churches in wherever you are, the Philippines, admire your elders. Do not criticize them. Learn wisdom from them. You see, in my age right now, I have discovered things that I have not been able to teach when I was younger. And I think, and I, I, I realize I have taught these things already because of experience, because of the, the grind of life every day. Because of observing other people, you learn. Gray hairs is truly a crown of an old man. So I'm not exalting myself because I'm old. I said observe your older folks in your churches, especially your fathers. Do not, do not despise your fathers. Whatever they are, whoever they are, whatever the character, he might be a drunkard or anything, you can learn wisdom from man, from an old man. Just pray for them that they will stop drinking or doing bad things. Pray. Who crowns your life with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Jack Manning tells us in a simple statement, he says, it is a delight to be with grateful people. Wow. Their spirit is catching. If you are with a grateful person, you can catch the spirit. It will change you. It is impossible to mix gratefulness or thankfulness with resentment. Wow. <laughs> you say you are grateful, but you resent. You are not truly grateful. You see, joy comes after being grateful. Not being grateful then. It should not be. There's also a story of uh, an older woman. I just read it this morning. It says here, there was a Bible student who visited this elderly, elderly woman who has an, a wasting this disease, they call. First, he, she could not move her feet. And she said, to the Bible student. I thank the Lord. I'm so grateful. I'm so glad that I can still move my body. <laughs> she cannot move her feet, but she can move her feet. A week later, she could not move her hands. I'm so glad I can still move my neck. <laughs> wow. Robin. And then the last week of the exposure trip of this student, he says, what if you lose your sight and your hearing? And still be glad because you are visiting. Wow. She disarmed Satan by those statements. Why? Because she was so great. The only thing that could defeat Satan, number one, is having an attitude of gratitude. You should be thankful. When you say thank you, Satan reaches in fear. When you say the blood of Jesus, Satan powers with fear. And when you say this is the cross of Jesus that I carry, Satan is thrown into the pits of hell. Amen? You see, sometimes we, we allow ourselves to be defeated. There was experience, there was one experience in my life that I cowered in fear. I was so afraid of the devil. When my business started to plummet down, I, I, I could just sit there 
in a corner of the house and do nothing. I was immobile. I remember Job. God took away his 14 children, thousands of sheep and cattle, no way of doing a living. And she was, he was afflicted by this disease, the sores in his body. And she was criticized by his wife. And the wife said, forget God and die. Curse God and die. But Job said, no. When I turn to my left, he is not here now. When I turn, turn to my left, my right, he is not here. I think I saw him in the front, but he wasn't here. I look at the back, I could not perceive him. But this is what he made when healing start coming upon him. Job 23, verse 10 to 12. Be encouraged about the verse. You see, oh, the verse that I uh, I told you before is in verse 8 and 9. When he felt something like healing, this is what Job said. When healing was coming, he was, he was starting to gain victory. And this is what I bring you today. Job said to his wife, But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Wow. He treated his trials, and he will come out of his trial. He will be refined like gold. My foot has been held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Who else? Who of you can say that in the midst of your trial? I will be coming out as a refined gold when my testing comes. I have not regained my wealth since the business was lost, but I found a new strength and character in my life. And I saw that God prospered my children. But sometimes you cannot curse Job's wife. She's the mother of Job's 14 children. We must be careful not to curse him or to condemn her. But we have to pray for our own strength during times of trials. Job for me is a hero. David for me is a hero. David was so filled with wisdom, with a poetic mind. How he describes God is like uh, it's like something that when you write a poem, you you don't you don't just write a falling leaf, but a leaf that is falling, shivering under the power of the wind. That's how David described his situation. Because he was a grateful man. He wore the longest necklace of gratitude wherever he faces God. David wasn't able to build the temple because his hand was filled with blood. It was not the blood of the soldiers that he killed in battle, but it was the blood of a single man whom he took the man's wife away, Uriah. He took away Bathsheba from Uriah because he was so enticed by the beauty of that woman. And sometimes you have also to be careful on how the way we perceive things or people, men and women. When you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you have already committed adultery in your heart. The same way to women. When you look at a man with lust, you have already committed adultery in your heart. That's why be careful. Be careful. I hope that I have brought a simple message for you today. Please don't forget it. You came from here, you're washed by the blood of the Lamb, you're justified, you're propitiated, you're blessed, you are justified, you have been forgiven, you have been blessed, you have been made righteous by the blood of God. And everything comes only in obedience to the word of God. Let's all rise and sit and, and, and pray.
Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have reminded us today about the blood of the Lord Jesus. That the way that we take is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a cross that saves us. It is a cross that will propel us into our destiny a hundred years later. It is a cross that will make us fly into your presence. But it is a cross that will elevate us into the grossness of our life, into the majestic presence of the sweetness of the grace of God. Father, we thank you for these people who are so faithful in serving you every day. I pray that you will protect them with the blessing of Psalm 91. That they will recognize you as their refuge, their strength, their rampart. And they will shield you with your feathers and under your wings. You will find, they will find refuge. And when they call upon your name, you will answer them because, you have, because they have acknowledged you as Lord and Savior. And when they call upon you, you will answer them. You will send your angels to protect them. And at their beating in prayer, O oh Lord, your angels will come upon them. You will lift them up so that they will, their foot will not strike against the stone. And show forth the sweetness and the joy of your salvation upon each and every one. Father, I bless your people today with your love. I bless them with your grace. Shower them with your mercy. Make them persons who have planned them to be. And I pray, Father, that your word will elevate them into a level that they will never be the same again. But carve at each by your hand into the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Love, joy, peace, mercy, long-suffering, meekness, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. Father, I bless them with your word today, with your spirit, over them with your blood. If possible, Lord, bathe them in your blood, soak them in your blood, so that they will be filled with all good things that they're life will be renewed like the eagles. Father, I thank you and I bless you for your word today. We give you praise. We are so grateful, Father. Thank you for your word. It is life unto us. It is a part of us. It is our whole being, Lord. I pray also, Father, that from our lips will come life-giving water. Whenever we speak, there are springs of life-giving water oozing out of our mouth and spirit. Father, I thank you. I bless you. I worship you. I glorify you. I exalt you. I magnify you. You're all worthy. You're amazing, Lord. You're so wonderful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a clap. Thank you, Lord.